ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد so last week then we were discussing the evidence for the four points that were mentioned at the beginning of this introduction those four points were what when the sheikh said right at the beginning that it is yajibu alayna ta'allumu arba'i masail so what are those four firstly knowledge al-ilm and then it was amal acting upon it and then it was a da'wah to ilayhi calling to that and then fourthly patience upon all of that and then the evidence for all that was surah al-asr because in surah al-asr allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions exactly those four points regarding iman which is knowledge and then acting upon it the righteous actions that are upon sincerity to Allah and following the sunnah and then on top of that da'wah and advising each other upon the truth calling to the truth and then fourthly the issue of patience because a servant needs patience in all of the affairs of his religion patience upon obedience to Allah remaining patient upon all of the acts of obedience that need to be done awakening early in the morning for fajr doing the other acts of worship you must restrict yourself upon that requires patience and also patience in staying away from the haram as-sabru an maharimillah to stay away from the haram and that which Allah has prohibited requires patience and thirdly patience ala aqdarillahi al-mu'limah upon the difficulties of the decree and remember patience in the Arabic language it refers to restricting oneself to control oneself and to restrict oneself that is what patience is so you control yourself and restrict yourself from the various affairs that are not to be done and you control yourself and restrict yourself within the boundaries of the worship of Allah and you control yourself and restrict yourself in the times of difficulties and hardships that may occur in the life of a person and no doubt they will occur those difficulties and hardships they do occur they are the tests and the trials that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places upon his servants Allah mentioned in the Quran those are the days that we alternate between the people those are the days that we alternate between the people days of happiness and joy in your life and days of sadness and grief in your life days that are rotated and altered amongst the people so those four points were mentioned in surah al-asr then we move on today to the statement of al-imam al-shafi'i and then the statement of al-imam al-bukhari firstly al-imam al-shafi'i and his name was what Muhammad ibn Idris there is a hadith a hadith where it says سيأتي على هذه الأمة رجل something like أشد أو أسوأ من إبليس أو أخطر من إبليس اسمه Muhammad ibn Idris there is a man who will come upon this Ummah more 
dangerous and worse than Iblis, his name will be Muhammad ibn Idris. Hadith. However, it is a hadith that is mawdu'ah, fabricated by the Ashab al Madahib from the followers, the Atba'ah, the Muta'asibun. So some of them made this hadith, fabricated this hadith. Wada'u hadha al hadith, that there will be a man more severe than Iblis. His name will be Muhammad ibn Idris. So they were obviously the ones who were against the madhab of Al-Imam Shafi'i. So that is a fabricated narration. So here we have Al-Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala. And when did Al-Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala die? Just so you have an idea of where this Imam lived in the context of things. When did Al-Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala die? Only one person knows? Two? Neither are from Rochdale. We need a Rochdale answer. We need a home answer. All right, from outside? 204 Hijri. He died in the year 204 Hijri. Al Mutawafa Sana Arba Mi'atain. Rahimahullah Ta'ala died in the year 204 Hijri. So that is around about a couple of hundred years, rounding it off after the death of the Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Incidentally, that is the year that another great Imam was actually born in. Al-Imam Shafi'i died in the year 204 Hijri. In that year, another great Imam was born. And that is Al-Imam Muslim. Born in the year 204 Hijri. So what does Al-Imam Shafi'i here say? What did Al-Imam Shafi'i here say regarding Surah Al-Asr? He said... قَالَ شَافِعِيُّ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى لَوْ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ حُجَّةً عَلَى خَلْقِهِ إِلَّا هَذِهِ السُّورَةِ لَكَفَتْهُمْ If Allah did not reveal an evidence upon His creation other than this surah, it would have been enough. It would have sufficed. Had Allah not revealed an evidence upon his creation besides this surah, it would have sufficed. What is the meaning of that statement of Imam Shafi'i? In fact, before we even get to the meaning of it, there is something we should highlight about this qawl. This statement of Imam Shafi'i, as you see in your texts, as you see in the Mutun, لَوْ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ حُجَّةً عَلَىٰ خَلْقِهِ إِلَّا هَذِهِ السُّورَ لَكَفَتْهُمْ This statement, it is only narrated by meaning. That is what appears to be the case. That this is بِالْمَعْنَى that this is not exactly what Al-Imam Shafi'i said word for word. It has been narrated in the book by a Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab or his students by meaning. That is what appears to be the case. And the reason why it appears to be the case, uh, just like a Sheikh Hamad al-Ansari, rahimahullah ta'ala said, al-zahir, أن كلام الإمام الشافعي نقل بالمعنى. This is what a Sheikh Hamad Al Ansari, رحمه الله تعالى, mentioned. فإنه الشيخ حمد لم يجد اللفظ الذي جاء في النص وإنما وجد هذا اللفظ الآخر. A Sheikh Hamad Al Ansari, one of the great scholars who passed away. Researched this statement of Al Imam Shafi'i, but he couldn't find anywhere in any of the books this exact statement in those words. 
Had Allah not revealed any other evidence upon his creation except this surah, it would have sufficed them. He couldn't find that wording exactly. So it appears this is only being mentioned by meaning, generally what Imam Shafi'i said. The actual wording that has been found from Imam Shafi'i is, لَوْ فَكَّرَ النَّاسُ فِي هَذِهِ السُورَةِ لَكَفَتْهُمْ That is the wording which is found. If the people pondered over Surah Al-Asr, then it would suffice them. Not that if Allah only revealed Surah Al-Asr, it would have been enough. Because obviously we know there are many rulings of the religion, halal, haram, sunnah, all types of things. They are not all mentioned just in Surah Al-Asr. So of course we would require all of the rest of the Quran and the rest of the Sunnah and everything. So the meaning and the intent of Imam Shafi'i wasn't how the exact wording indicates that this surah by itself is enough for the whole of Islam. It doesn't mean that. What he meant was this surah, if you think about it carefully, then it will cover you for a broad range of Islam. Because it covers you in talking about knowledge. It covers you in talking about action. It covers you in talking about giving da'wah. It covers you in talking about patience. So it covers a large area. And that is what Imam Shafi'i meant. If you think about this surah carefully and you ponder over its meanings, then that will give you a broad understanding of a large aspect of Islam. So that is what Imam Shafi'i has mentioned here. لو فكر الناس فيها لكفتهم لجمعها للخير بحذافيره فإنها دلت على العلم والعمل والدعوة إلى الحق والصبر على الأذى فيه فتضمنت جميع مراتب الكمال الإنساني فهي حقيقة بأن يقال فيها ما قاله هذا الإمام الجليل so this particular surah, it covers all of those four aspects as we mentioned, and therefore it has a broad reach over various aspects of the religion. And that is what the statement of Imam Shafi'i indicates regarding it. Also, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah قال, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ أَخْبَرَ أَنَّ جَمِيعَ النَّاسِ خاصرون إلا من كان في نفسه مؤمنا صالحا ومع غيره موصيا بالحق موصيا بالصبر. Uh, Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah said that this surah Allah is telling us that all of the people are in loss except those who in of themselves are believers and doing righteous actions and with regards to others are enjoining that good and the truth and enjoining the patience amongst themselves. So that is a tremendous surah, surah to asr and it has tremendous meanings within it. Then after that we have the statement moving on now the statement of Al-Imam Al-Bukhari. Al-Imam Al-Bukhari, then what was his name? Muhammad ibn Ismail. Muhammad ibn Ismail, Al-Imam Al-Bukhari. And when did he die? Just to get the idea of the context of where these Imams were, when they lived. When did Al-Imam Al-Bukhari die? One person... To around about 250, no good. We need an exact answer. So, 256. So, 52 years after Al Imam Shafi'i. So, he died in the year 256 Hijri. In the year 256 Hijri. So Imam al-Bukhari, what did he say? قال al-Bukhari رحمه الله تعالى باب العلم 
قبل القول والعمل he mentioned as a chapter heading باب the chapter العلم قبل القول والعمل that knowledge comes before statements and actions knowledge precedes statements and actions ترجم رحمه الله بالبداء بالعلم لأن تعلم العلم الفرض مقدم على القول والعمل because learning the knowledge that is given precedence priority before the statements and the actions وذلك أن قول المرء وعمله and that is because the statements of a person قول, قول المرء وعمله his statements and his actions لا يصح إلا إذا صدر عن علم a person's statements and actions will not be legitimate and correct unless they are based upon knowledge. A person's statements, a person's actions will not be correct unless he is saying those things and doing those things based upon having knowledge that this is what the religion uh, states we are to say and we are to do. A person who doesn't have knowledge then that person may end up saying things, may end up doing things that are not prescribed in the religion. They are not in the sunnah. He therefore ends up performing bid'ah, ends up performing innovation and misguidance because what he's doing and what he's saying is not based upon the evidences of the Qur'an and the sunnah. So how are you going to know what you're saying and what you're doing is from the Qur'an and the Sunnah by making sure you first gain knowledge of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. You want to do a certain act of worship, so you learn from the Qur'an and the Sunnah how that worship is done. When it comes to something so common like the prayer, the prayer that you pray five times a day, that prayer, an act of worship, the first thing you're going to be held accountable upon on the day of judgment. The first thing you are accountable upon is your prayer. So now, in order for you to pray properly, just as the Prophet ﷺ said, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Pray as you have seen me pray. So for now, all of us to pray properly and accurately in accordance to the sunnah, we need to sit down and learn about how to pray properly. What is the sunnah in the prayer? What are the arkan, the wajibat, the sunan, the obligations, the pillars? What are the various aspects of the prayer that must be done? It becomes invalid if you don't. What are the sunnah aspects of the prayer? What happens if you miss an obligation of the prayer? Prostrations of forgetfulness, etc. You need to have knowledge of the prayer so that you're praying accurately. Many people do not. They have gone ahead into the action without ever having sat and studied and learned how to do that action. So I'll give you an example of what Sheikh al Thaymeen rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned. He said some people when they pray, when they go into the ruku' they go into the ruku' and then as they come out, Allahu liman hamida rabbana wa lakal hamd, as they are coming out, they only come out to approximately 45 degrees. If the ruku' is your level, and then you're coming up, they only come up halfway. And then straight away, Allahu Akbar, down into the prostration. Common thing. You see somebody praying, they'll come out halfway and straight back down. They won't come up properly stand 
And then Allahu Akbar go down again into prostration. It's more like one quick movement they make. Sami'Allahu liman hamda rabbana wa alhamd Allahu Akbar. And they've only come up halfway. They never stood up straight. True? Many people. That, as Shaykh al says, a person who prays like that, his prayer technically is invalid. Technically, his prayer is invalid because he is missing one of the pillars of the prayer he mentioned, which is to come and stand up straight after the ruku' and then go down again. You may see other people, they go into prostration and the seven body parts that are supposed to touch the ground, your two feet, your two knees, your two hands and your forehead nose, maybe one of those body parts never touches the ground. Your prostration is invalid. When it comes to wudu, another common mistake when it comes to wudu. And imagine this is something we do every single day of our lives. A person goes to make wudu. So the first thing you do is you open your tap and then what? What's the first thing you wash? So you wash your hands. And then what do you do after that? So mouth and nose. Then after that. The face, all of it, then after that, the arms, how do you do your arms? So people do what? And this is a common thing, common thing. When they get to the arms, they put the water in their hands and they flick the water down to run down their arm. Flick the hand up, the water they've got in their hand, flick it up so it runs down their forearm and then they clean up their forearm. Isn't that a common way? which means they don't do their hands again because they've already done the hands at the beginning. So at that stage, they get the water in their hand, they flick it up and they do all of their arm and their elbow and their forearm, but they don't actually do the hand again. That then is really an invalid wudu. Because when you wash your hands at the beginning, the first thing, that is only sunnah. You don't even have to do that. When you get to this part of washing your arms, you have to wash your hands in it. And that is another great misconception people don't understand. The beginning one is only a sunnah, the washing of the hands. Afterwards is the obligation of the wudu washing the hands. So these kinds of things, details that we may not be aware of because we haven't gained knowledge. There's another example. There was a man once... He came to the haram in Medina <coughs> and he came to the lesson of one of the scholars and asked a question to the scholar. And this was in Ramadan. He said to the scholar, Shaykh, for the last few years, not just this Ramadan and the last Ramadan, for the last few years, he and his wife have been having intercourse during Ramadan in the day. And he said, I never knew. I never knew that it is impermissible for the jima'ah fi nahari Ramadan. He said, I never knew it's haram to do this in Ramadan when you're fasting. Few years now. We didn't know and we've ended up doing that. So now that's an example again. Somebody acting without having knowledge without knowing what the rules of Ramadan and the rules of fasting are, look what happened. Another example I saw with my own eyes too. In the Sa'i, when you get to the section which is now highlighted with the green, when you get to that section that is highlighted in the green, you're supposed to run. And the sunnah properly is you properly run. If you're able and it's possible, it's a proper running. However, is that something which is legislated for the women and the elderly, etc.? No. But I saw once a man in his 40s with an elderly woman, most likely his mother, looked like in her 80s, old woman. And he was making her run across the green section, an elderly lady, probably in her late 80s. Again, due to his lack of knowledge that it is not an obligation upon her or a sunnah upon her to try and do that with that state of body, with that state of age. So these are the points.
that a person who doesn't have knowledge of something, you're going to end up saying things, doing things that are not from the Quran or the Sunnah. They are not from the religion. They are not what the Prophet ﷺ prescribed to us. That's why Al Imam Al Bukhari says, Al ilm qabla al qawli wal amal. Knowledge comes before statements and actions. Knowledge is required before statements and actions. Like we said before, faqidu shay la yu'atihi. Somebody who hasn't got something, you haven't got it in the first place, you cannot give it to anybody else. You cannot even practice it yourself if you haven't got it. You don't have that knowledge, then how are you going to do that practice, that worship, and you don't know how? You want to go and do hajj, and you've never ever learned what hajj is, how hajj works, what you're supposed to do when you get there. So what are you going to do? It requires for you to learn all of that before you fly out. Hence, you have this clear principle in the religion that knowledge comes before statements and actions. Statements for yourself, actions for yourself, your own worship, your own obedience. Statements and actions for others in terms of da'wah can only occur once you have knowledge of what you're talking about. You want to give da'wah to somebody who's upon misguidance. You need to have understanding of how to give him da'wah, what the evidences are. You want to give da'wah to the kuffar outside. You need to have knowledge of the basics, knowledge of understanding tawheed, knowledge of understanding these full books like the three principles. What are you going to give them in terms of da'wah and you don't know the three principles yet? You don't know the basics of explaining to the kuffar who is Allah. What is Islam and who is Muhammad? How can you go give da'wah if you don't know these basics? So this is the key. Knowledge before statements and actions. Again, this is the statement of Imam al-Bukhari. It is not an ayah of the Quran. It is not a hadith. So in that case, ideally we need some proof to back up the statement of Imam al-Bukhari. Proof to back up the statement that we are now saying is a principle of the religion. And there is proof, and it is mentioned directly next, where the ayah of the Qur'an is quoted, وَالدَّلِيلُ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى فَاعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا فَاعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكَ have knowledge that there is no deity worthy of worship in truth except Allah. And then seek forgiveness for your sins. Have knowledge regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no deity worthy of worship in truth except He. Then seek forgiveness for your sins. In the ayah, two things are mentioned. Having knowledge and seeking forgiveness. Seeking forgiveness is obviously an, a statement, an action. Having knowledge of Allah, He is the only one deserving of worship. That knowledge is knowledge. Which of the two comes first in the ayah? Which of the two are we told to do first before the other? Knowledge of Allah, then seeking of the forgiveness. Meaning knowledge then statement and action. So that is a proof in the Quran highlighting how knowledge comes first, then statements and actions come after. That is why the scholars, they mention, when you seek knowledge, it's a long pathway to go across. Seeking knowledge is a long pathway. And the level of giving da'wah is further down that pathway. It's a long ladder to climb. The step, the step where you can give da'wah is up there on top of the ladder somewhere. You have to climb up, go through the stages, bit by bit, learning the knowledge until you get high enough to that ladder, to that step where you can now give da'wah. But the scholars, they said many people 
They are hasty. They are hasty too fast. They want to skip up the ladder straight to the step where you can give da'wah. And they have not gone through those stages carefully and properly in learning the basics of the religion, memorizing the ayat, understanding them properly. But they're all at the level of wanting to give da'wah to everyone. And that is something for those who have been to places like universities and campuses. Everybody's a da'i, mashallah. When you go to a campus, you go to university, everybody's a da'i. Everybody, mashallah, they only just yesterday started practicing. Two days later, they've become a qualified da'i. And everybody's giving the da'i and everybody's talking and everybody's debating because that is the mentality they put into you anyway at the university level, academic level. But this is the problem that you have widespread. People have skipped over all of the steps and they've jumped onto the top side of the ladder without going through the steps first. So now you go to YouTube and mashallah, ulama, so many. Everywhere on YouTube there is an alim. Everywhere there is a sheikh, there is an ustad, there is this, there is that. And nowadays, you know, in the olden days, in the olden days to become respected as a sheikh or a, or a student, to become respected on that level in the olden days, hundreds of years ago, you had to actually teach and you had to have something and you had to build some level of students and then those students would pass on the details and word would spread about you being a teacher. In the olden days, you had to do something. You had to know a little bit, sit down, have classes, teach, and then word spreads about this teacher. These days, you don't even have to do any of that. You don't have to do anything. All you need to do these days is know how to use YouTube. Know how to set up an account, and you can put the title down yourself. Sheikh such and such. Give yourself the title Sheikh. Put the, the, the books behind you or Photoshop. Put the Photoshop of some books behind you if you haven't got any and sit down, get a shimag, iron it before you make the video and you are now a sheikh. Hundreds, thousands of these sheikhs on YouTube. And are there in reality anybody who has studied? Are there in reality anybody who could even explain to you the details of this small book? All of these sheikhs on YouTube, all of these so-called uh, Ustad, this and Sheikh, this and whatever they give their titles of. Could they even explain this? If we were to pick out a page here and say, okay, here, uh, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhabi says X, Y, and Z, what does that mean? They've probably not even looked at this, if ever they've looked at it in their lives. But they are Sheikhs. So beware, knowledge is not taken from these unknown, unqualified individuals. Ibn Sirini said, this knowledge is religion so look carefully where you take your religion from don't just blindly anything on youtube this one's a sheikh and that one's a mufti and this one's this and this one's that and all these people they become famous through youtube famous through all these social media platforms and the reality, if you sit down with them and discuss with them and debate with them, they have nothing. They are bankrupt. They are bankrupt in reality and they are not students of knowledge. So you have much of that going on these days. So be careful. Do not take your knowledge randomly of YouTube. Don't take it randomly of social media. You take your knowledge from those who are qualified. They've gone and studied properly. They've learned the books and the texts. The scholars at the head of them and then the students thereafter. So here we see the importance of knowledge before statements and actions. And that Allah mentioned in the Quran too. Allah raises the people of knowledge. Allah raises them in level. And so a person who desires raise without knowledge and without going through that then they are only fooling themselves. A person who wants to be recognized as a talib ilm a person who wants to be recognized as a senior brother, then what have you done to deserve that recognition you desire? 
Do you go to the classes every week and you study and you learn and you memorize like so many other brothers do? Do you do that? If you don't, then you are only fooling yourself in wanting to be perceived as something and you cannot put the graft in for it. So knowledge comes before statements and actions. So here he says, فَبَدَأَ بِالْعِلْمِ قَبْلَ الْقَوْلِ وَالْعَمَلِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began with knowledge before statements and actions. There are some statements of the Salaf regarding this too. Al-Hasan al-Basri, it was said to him, قِيلَ لَهُ أَلَيْسَ مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ it was said to Al Hassan Al Basri that the one who says La ilaha illallah, he will enter paradise. No, the one who says La ilaha illallah enters paradise. No, so Al Hassan Al Basri said, Qal man adda fardaha dakhal al jannah. Yushiru bidalika ila anna al murad. هو الفهم والعمل والإتيان بشروط الشهادتين وتحققها. He said, the one who performs the obligation of the shahada, then yes, he enters paradise. Meaning the one who has knowledge of what the shahada is and then acts and implements it, then yes, paradise. But not just somebody who says it without any prior knowledge of it or acting upon it in the proper way upon that knowledge then no that type of person may be saying la ilaha illallah and still committing absolute pure shirk it is not just the statement it is the knowledge behind it and acting upon it similarly wahab ibn munabbih from the tabi'in it was said to him alaysa la ilaha illallah miftahul jannah isn't la ilaha illallah the key to paradise? As long as you say la ilaha illallah, is that not the key to paradise? He said, Qal bala. He said, yes, of course. La ilaha illallah. That is the key to paradise, tawheed. But then he said, lakin, laysa min miftah illa walahu asnan. فَمَنْ أَتَى بِمِفْتَاحٍ ذِي أَسْنَانٍ فُتِحَ لَهِ He said, however, even though yes, لا إله إلا الله is the key to paradise. However, every key has its grooves. Every key has the teeth. And so if a person comes with a key that has the shaped teeth, the grooves, then it will open the door. But if you come with a blunt key and try opening something, the key does not open it. So he said, yes, la ilaha illallah. But not as a blunt statement, rather as a statement with the teeth and the grooves in the example of the key, meaning with your knowledge and understanding of it and your practice and action upon it, upon that knowledge so you see here this statement mentioned in the three fundamental principles that knowledge comes before statements and actions that it requires that order the order of learning first the order of gaining knowledge first and then moving on to the affairs of your statements and actions upon knowledge. Because what do we say in Surah Al-Fatiha every single raka'ah that we pray? غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ الضالين, who are they? The ones who went astray. The ones who went astray are those who tried to do actions without knowledge. The Christians at the head of them. They try to do actions and worship without knowledge. So they went astray. The Muslim does not desire that. 
So this is a key which is neglected in our times. Everybody wants to be a sheikh. Everybody wants to be an ustad. Everybody wants to be recognized as a person of knowledge. But if that is done upon no knowledge, no studying, no nothing, then it is only a delusion that person is in. It requires knowledge before da'wah. Knowledge before you can worship Allah properly. So that is why it is key. And that is why in Surah Al-Asr, it's mentioned at the beginning that all of mankind is in loss. Except for those firstly who have Iman. And that Iman is upon knowledge. Without knowledge, what are you going to do? No knowledge of how to pray, how to make wudu, how to worship Allah. No knowledge of what Tawheed is, no knowledge of what Shirk is. Then what are you going to do? How are you going to fulfill the objective of your worship, the objective of your creation in this world? So knowledge is of vital importance. Knowledge before statements and actions. Then we move on to the next section. I'lam rahimakallah. Again, he begins in that same way. Have knowledge. May Allah have mercy upon you. And this is from the good etiquette of the Shaykh, from the good mannerism of the Shaykh, that he makes dua for his students and he shows his genuine sincerity in wanting the people to benefit. أَنَّهُ يَجِبُ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ وَمُسْلِمَةٍ That it is binding upon every Muslim, male and female, تَعَلُّمُ ثَلَاثِ هَذِهِ الْمَسَائِلِ وَالْعَمَلُ بِهِنَّ He now says, after giving that introduction about those four points, that there is an obligation upon every Muslim, male or female, to learn three important issues and to act upon them. Three important affairs and to act upon them. The first of those then is the first of those actions and al-ula anna allah khalaqana wa razaqana wa lam yatrukna hamala bal arsala ilayna rasula faman ata'ahu dakhala al-jannah wa man 'asahu dakhala an-nar The first point here he mentions now that is obligatory upon all of us to understand and learn and practice is to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and provided for us and did not leave us without objective. Created us provided for us, sustained us, and didn't just leave us for no reason. Didn't just leave us on this earth for no reason. There's a reason why Allah placed us here. And He sent the messengers to us, so whoever, or the messenger to us, so whoever obeys Him will enter paradise, and whoever disobeys, then he will enter the hellfire. This is highlighting some basic clear points. The first of those, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is indeed our creator. Allah is al-khaliq. He is the creator. And that is from the rububiyyah of Allah. That we believe only Allah created this whole universe. Nobody else created it. Nobody else helped Allah to create it. Nobody else had any share in creating it. It was purely created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. He is the creator. وَرَزَقَنَا And then on top of that, 
He is the one who provides and sustains us. He is the one who gives us the food and the drink and the air and the clothes and the homes. He is the one alone who can provide for us. There's nobody else who sustains us and gives us the fruits and the air and the water. All of that given to us, all of this rizq, all of these provisions, all of this sustenance, then it is purely from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is also from the rububiyyah, the lordship of Allah, that only he does that. Only he alone created everything. Only he alone provides for us and sustains us. And then the important point here it mentions too. Allah didn't leave us without a reason. Allah didn't just make us and give us food and everything, but we can live here on this earth for no reason. There is a reason. Allah didn't just leave us without any guidance. Didn't just leave us without any purpose. Rather, Allah created us, provided for us, and then sent us guidance so that we know how to live in this world and what to do with our lives. Allah didn't just leave us not knowing what to do and what we're supposed to be doing on this earth. Allah gave us the reason how? By sending the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and before that to the other nations, their previous prophets and messengers sent that messenger with the guidance sent the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the revelation in order to guide the people to that which is halal and warn them from haram guide them to the path of allah and keep them away from the path to paradise so that's why it says فَمَنْ أَطَاعَهُ دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ so whoever obeys the messenger will enter paradise and whoever disobeys him will enter hellfire and that is like a hadith where the prophet sallallahu said kullu ummati yadkhulun al jannah all of my ummah will enter paradise all of my ummah will enter paradise illa man aba except for those who don't want to except for those who refuse hadith all of my ummah will enter paradise except those who refuse they don't want to so then the companion said to the prophet the obvious question which is who would possibly not want to go to paradise who will refuse O messenger of allah who would not want to go to paradise? So then the Prophet ﷺ explained to them, "Man ata'ani dakhal al jannah, wa man asani faqad aba." Whoever obeys me will enter paradise, but whoever disobeys me, then they are the people who are refusing their chance to go to paradise. If they are going to disobey the messenger, then they are refusing themselves. Paradise. If you want paradise, then you obey the messenger. Refusing to obey the messenger, then you are in effect refusing to go to paradise. Knowing that the way to paradise is to obey the messenger, not disobey. So here he makes that very clear point that Allah created us, He provided for us. And look at all of this mentioned here the rububiyah of Allah. He is the lone creator, the lone provider. He is the one who then from his mercy sent us guidance so that we know what to do in this world and how to live our lives. And then we've been told very simply and clearly, whomsoever obeys, follows that guidance, follows the messenger, then that is the path to paradise. And whomsoever disobeys, then they are the ones refusing the entry into paradise. That is where we'll have to round it off today. 
Next week we'll start with the evidence for what you just said. This whole book, everything that is said, you will find that the Sheikh gives you evidence for it. So now he's just said this first point. Allah created us, provided for us, gave us the revelation, the messengers. We have to obey to enter paradise. If you disobey, you won't. What's the proof for all of that? That's what we'll begin with in the next session. The proof for all of that we've just mentioned. So we'll round off on that point for today. Make sure you keep revising over these sections. This book, it's one of the fundamental books, one of the principal books of the religion to study and to learn the basics of the religion. So keep revising over the previous sessions too. Go over the recordings, go over the text, try to memorize whoever can memorize. This is a book that should be memorized. The actual text is barely five, six pages long. So make sure you keep revising properly, going over the sections properly. And we'll carry on from next week, inshallah ta'ala. Any questions or anything up to that? Any questions or anything up to that? In that case, next week it is, inshallah ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.